So thank you very much, Jeremy, for that kind introduction. And I have to say it's an absolute honor um, to, to be standing here to, this evening um, as someone who started life as a lowly postdoctoral fellow and junior lecturer on the RDS Council as it used to be when it was chaired by Sir David Jack. And I'll mention David again later in my lecture because he's had profound influence on my own research activities and I, I think he's been outstanding as a person contributing to this area. Now, as Jeremy said, my, my whole career has really been looking at understanding um, lung disease and particularly asthma and COPD and I wanted to concentrate on that this evening and talk about how animals have helped us develop the drugs that we use and how they continue to help us understand both the pathogenesis of disease but also in finding new treatments. Now, lest you think that we don't need to work on lung disease anymore, this is the European Lung White Book from 2013, showing you that one in eight deaths in the EU are caused by respiratory disease, and a considerable number of people die every year from respiratory diseases, and indeed, they occupy, obviously, a lot of our hospital beds and take a great um, part of the healthcare budget, particularly this time of year with people getting chest infections. So this is an area that costs society a lot of money, and whilst we've made significant progress, as I'll hopefully show you, I think there is still more to do. Now, I realise we've got a very mixed audience, and just really to say that if you look at someone undergoing an asthma attack, and this is a, a picture of somebody undergoing a bronchoscopy, um, you can see, without being an expert, that there is profound inflammation, edema, fluid occurring in the, the airway lumen, that brings about this wheezing and coughing that's seen in asthmatics. And for many years, we've used drugs to relieve this by relaxing the airway smooth muscle. But over the last 20 years particularly, we've recognized that this is a complex inflammatory condition. And sadly, people, particularly under the age of 30, still die from asthma. Several thousand people died in the UK last year from asthma, mainly under the age of 30. And this is because, as you can see here, if they do not treat that underlying inflammatory response properly, we end up with a very thick mucus plug obstructing the airway lumen and preventing gas exchange. And no one in 2017 should be dying of asthma, but unfortunately, we still have this situation um, going on. If we look at this histologically, it's very clear that this is indeed um, something that is due to inflammation, we can see inflammation into the airway wall, and you can see here the airway lumen, which is absolutely um, covered or, or uh, is, is filled with mucus. And this mucus, I can tell you from experience of working with airways like this, is actually like cement. To get this out is really difficult because the inflammatory cells coming into the lung release enzymes and mediators that change the composition of the mucus. And again, we now recognize that this inflammation contributes to this mucus plugging. If we turn to COPD, and I started going to respiratory meetings in the 1980s, and COPD was almost never talked about because it was a disease associated with smoking, and everyone said, let's give up smoking. And clearly, that's very sound advice. However, I've put up there air pollution, because we now recognize, and I think in the next 20 years, we're going to see more and more younger patients developing COPD, having never seen a cigarette in their life, because they have exposure to air pollution, and the air pollution in turn is producing inflammatory changes in the lung that are different to asthma, but nonetheless are causing profound changes in disease. And in particular, it leads to bronchitis early on, and then in a longer period of time, we get alveolar wall destruction and emphysema. And if we look histologically, we can see on the left a healthy normal lung parenchyma, and you can see your, your airways are there for gas exchange. They're the size of a tennis court in, in, in um, most of us. And in the middle, we have an early inflammatory response in the form of bronchitis. And on the other side, we have the extreme form and we get alveolar destruction. And of course, this is not something we can reverse. We cannot rebuild airways, um, but we can, I think, in the longer term, hopefully prevent this. And if we look at this at a different level, you can see compared to a, a lungs from someone who does not have emphysema from somebody that has, you can see the profound pathological changes that we're up against and, and trying to prevent. 
Now, actually, the pharmacology of asthma and COPD is relatively simple. We use bronchodilator drugs now and anti-inflammatory drugs in both conditions. We have the short-acting beta agonists, and I'll come back to this shortly, such as salbutamol, or for those of you who have asthma or know people who have asthma, the blue inhaler. And more recently, we have longer-acting beta agonists. But most importantly, in the last 15 years, there's been the introduction of fixed combinations of taking bronchodilators and anti-inflammatory drugs together. Because physicians want the patient to have the anti-inflammatory drug, primarily glucocorticosteroids, whereas the patients have what I call the McDonald effect. They like this acute bronchodilation um, and symptom relief. And we have some very, very successful drug combinations, both in terms of medical care and also commercial success. So the formoterol budesonide and salmeterol fluticasone, between them generate about $11 billion a year um, from, from sales to people who for treating asthma. Now, if we look at the beta agonists, there's actually a very long history going back to 3000 BC and the discovery of, of, of ephedra. Um, and ephedra and epinephrine, as we know now as adrenaline, of course, were all very successful at causing the airways to open and people to feel better, but they had the problem of also increasing heart rate and blood pressure. And over the years, we've made this progressive improvement in these drugs, and particularly the ability to deliver these drugs directly into the lung through aerosols or powders, right up to day where we have drugs that actually one puff can last for three days. And that is a profound improvement in terms of both selectivity of the drug, but also the duration of action to make it easier for patients to comply with. Now, everybody in this room is familiar with this particular blue inhaler, which contains salbutamol. It's used by approximately 90% of the world's asthmatics, but no one gives a second thought, really, as to how it got there. And I think it's uh, only fitting this evening that I pay tribute to David, because David chaired the Research Defence Society Council when I joined. David is the man, if we go back, who really discovered beta agonists and particularly salbutamol but also his team went on to discover salmetrol, the long-acting beta agonist, and very importantly, as they've come on to, um, topical corticosteroids. And I think the world owes this man a lot, and I think he should really should have deserved um, um, to have a Nobel Prize. And sadly, David passed away a few years ago, but he's certainly been a fantastic mentor to me, and I'll come back to a project that I worked on previous to, or prior to him um, passing. Now, I want to take you back to 1969, because this is actually the first demonstration that salbutamol was a new class of drug. It was a beta adrenoceptor stimulant, but unlike adrenaline, it also stimulates heart rate and blood pressure. This drug at the right doses did not. And this experiment was initially done in guinea pigs, as you see here. So this is actually showing you the overflow of, of, of air and giving salbutamol to show that you can suppress the effect of 5-HT in causing bronchoconstriction. He then went on to show this is through a beta receptor because if he blocked with a beta blocker, um, the response disappeared. You can also see that when you aerosolize this to guinea pigs, and the important thing here is that he did all of his work early on in guinea pigs, you can see that there is this very clear dose-related effect when we inhale salbutamol in guinea pigs to reduce bronchoconstriction. And the number of people this very minute taking salbutamol somewhere on the planet have no idea that this all started with dosing guinea pigs. And in fact, David really was, I think, important in going from what was adrenaline that affected both alpha and beta receptors, isoprenaline, which was a beta uh, but non-selective beta agonist, two salbutamol shown there. And at the bottom is salmeterol. And salmeterol is a drug that instead of taking it four to six times a day, he put this long lipid tail on it to produce a drug that is actually active by bronchodilating twice a day. Now, how did he do that it was very simple. And I think, unfortunately, we've forgotten how we've discovered many of the drugs that actually work. And this is actually a series of experiments that have been done by taking an isolated guinea pig trachea, electrically stimulating it, and the little spikes you see there are actually the contraction of the tissue. 
And if you look at what happens if we put isoprenaline on, there's a very transient reduction in the contraction of the airway smooth muscle. The same is true with salbutamol. You can see it's, it reverses. It's got a very short half-life. But then look at what happens when he puts this new drug, Salmetro, on the guinea pig trachea. You can see it's suppressed, and seven hours later it stays suppressed. And that is translated into the clinic as a drug that we now have twice a day. And this very same assay has been used to now, as I say, discover drugs that are active for once a day, or in some cases, even longer. So the guinea pig has been profoundly useful in helping us discover a very, very effective clinical bronchodilator for treating asthma and COPD. The other thing, and this is again taken from one of David's early studies, he actually, at the same time as doing these experiments in guinea pig trachea, also took pieces of um, tissue from the heart, for example, to actually show that you've also got very selective effects in the airway, but you do not have the same effect on receptors in the heart. Now, the other major class of drugs that are used today, not just for asthma and COPD, but a range of inflammatory conditions, of course, are glucocorticosteroids. And animals have helped us really profoundly in getting to the drugs that we've got today, and again, we take um, for granted. So we have to go back to the 1940s, when cortisone was extracted from the adrenal glands and used as an anti-inflammatory drug. But of course, cortisone, whilst effective, also suppresses your hypothalamic pituitary axis, and it leads to all sorts of changes in the endocrine system that are unwanted in people with inflammatory conditions. It was David's work that led to the discovery of betlamethasone dipropionate. And please, if you ever write betlamethasone down in any article, make sure you put the dipropionate on it. Because David once said to me when I left it off, it wouldn't do the same thing without the dipropionate. It's there to give it the activity locally in the tissue because this is the first steroid that was developed for the treatment of asthma in 1972, where we could inhale the beclomethasone, have a very pronounced anti-inflammatory effect in the lung, but it was poorly bioavailable, and therefore you did not have the same degree of suppression of the hypothalamic pituitary axis. And this drug, and subsequently the discovery of other topical steroids, such as budesonide, um, have really revolutionised the treatment of asthma and COPD because we can now give large doses locally to get a very clear anti-inflammatory effect without the systemic problems associated with oral or systemic steroids. And I just wanted you to go back to, um, this is a patent actually for fluticasone and other steroids, but the same was true of beclomethasone, of how this drug was actually shown to be anti-inflammatory. It was nothing to do with molecular biology. It was nothing to do with cellular biology. It was a very simple test called the croton oil test. And you rub croton oil on the ear of an animal, and you can compare the activity to suppress inflammation locally in the ear whilst measuring levels in the blood and changes in the hypothalamic pituitary axis, as simple as that. And this test has been used widely to discover nearly all the steroids that we currently have in clinical practice. And this can be done in rats, it can be done in mice. And you can see here, by rubbing the croton oil onto the ear, we end up with a local um, inflammatory response. And we can then um, add a topically active anti-inflammatory drug to see if we get suppression. Now, the reason that I show you this is, and people forget this, is that the activity of all the currently topically active steroids actually weren't developed for the lung. They were developed in the skin. And they use something called the McKenzie skin blanching test. And that is that you, the light's probably not conducive to seeing it properly here, but if you put steroids topically on the skin, you get blanching. And the blanching is a feature of the vasoconstriction caused by the steroid reducing blood flow and why steroids actually have an acute anti-inflammatory effect. And one of the reasons, in my opinion, we've not managed to find um, so-called soft or um, safer steroids beyond the ones we have is because this is a non-genomic effect and we've spent our entire life trying to find um, effects of drugs that affect the genome around steroids and that has not proved very successful to date. Now the reason I show you this is if you go back to the potency of these corticosteroids in this rodent test in the ear 
against the uh, ability to be anti-inflammatory compared to their ability to suppress the hypothalamic pituitary actus, you can get a therapeutic index. And as reviewed by Phillips and colleagues some years ago, that therapeutic index, the potency of these steroids, absolutely predicts their potency in the nose and also in the lung. So they were never, ever developed just for the lung. They were developed topically for a whole range of things, which, of course, is why we can use corticosteroids topically in other tissues. And what happened in the rat and the mouse absolutely bore out what happened when we did this blanching test in human skin. It predicted. So a very simple assay in vivo predicted the potency of these steroids in man. Now, a third class of drug that has been um, introduced for the treatment of asthma was really something that I started my PhD on, which was um, the so-called leukotriene receptor antagonists. And they were approved in 1998, Monte Lucas, as the first tablet that actually acted as an antagonist for leukotrienes. And I'm often asked how we got there, and you have to go back to the 1940s from experiments taking venom from snake venom adding it to guinea pig lung, and as you can see on the left from the original paper in the 1940s, getting contraction of the tissue that was not due to histamine. And we're thinking now in the mindset of the 1940s, that was a very novel observation, the contraction was long-lasting, and it was actually the day that I got my BSc degree, the paper appeared in Nature from Priscilla Piper and Howard Morris, uh, and I got asked about this at my Viva, which I thought was really unfriendly. Um, given it came out in the morning, my vibe was at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. But to identify SRSA as leukotriene C4 and D4, that being these very powerful lipids produced from arachidonic acid that were distinct from the prostaglandins blocked by aspirin. And then receptors appeared. We could find drugs that targeted this, and Montelukast being the first. Now, I say this because this is a tablet. It's very widely used in certain parts of the world, particularly the US, because it's not a steroid. And it's actually something um, that has generated commercially a lot of money, $4 billion a year for Merck um, since it was actually approved. Now, you might think it's all good. We've got some very effective drugs. But actually, respiratory, this is a recent um, study from Tufts University with the FDA. And actually, respiratory has had a lot of failures. And the question is, why have we had lots of failures? And I might come back to that later um, if we have time. But partly, I think, is that we've become too reliant on the mouse. And um, it's a discussion we might have later on. But clearly, we still have quite a lot of failures in the respiratory area um, compared to other therapeutic areas. What is absolutely clear, particularly for COPD, is we still need new drugs, and particularly new anti-inflammatory drugs. We have very good bronchodilators. And I say that because this is one of three very large studies in the literature showing if you give inhaled steroids every day over many, many years, it has no impact in the majority of people in the decline of lung function. Now, that means that whilst they're being used for the majority of people, it may not be the best thing to do. We also now know that many of these patients have a bigger risk of pneumonia. And in fact, there's a very recent study in the New England Journal of Medicine that if you withdraw steroids from the majority of patients with COPD, nothing happens. Now, that means, given I've shown you it's an inflammatory condition, there is a need for novel anti-inflammatory drugs in this disease. And so, with David, I set about trying to say, can we find new drugs that were alternatives to steroids that actually could improve on some of the therapies we have? Because each of them whilst they're effective, does also have um, significant shortcomings. And for that, we turn to a group of enzymes called phosphodiesterases, a very complex set of enzymes. There are, in fact, 11 families of, of, of phosphodiesterase enzymes that actually are involved in modulating second messengers in cells, um, the cyclic nucleotides, cyclic GMP, and cyclic AMP. Now, I don't need to tell... Most of you in this room, that if we inhibit PD5, it's the basis for why um, we have the effect of sildenafil or Viagra and many others that have followed that actually bring about vasodilation and um, in erectile dysfunction. We've used inhibitors of PD3, such as milrinone for heart failure, for claudication. The question is, given we now know that PD4 is found in inflammatory cells and PD3 is found 
in um, airway smooth muscle, could we actually target this to produce new drugs for asthma and COPD? Now, I'm pleased to say that one of these, reflumolast, has recently been approved for the treatment of COPD as a PD4 inhibitor, and also another one called a premolast has recently been found for the treatment of psoriatic arthritis. Now, what David and I set out to do, and I'm pleased to say I think we have succeeded in doing this, is to really um, find a class of drug that is both bronchodilator and anti-inflammatory in a single molecule that is not a beta agonist and is not a steroid. And I want to acknowledge particularly Alec Oxford, who is a Royal Society medalist in chemistry for his discovery and, and synthesis of sumatriptan, but also David, who I've mentioned, and my own group, particularly Victoria Boswell-Smith, who did the initial experiments, and my late friend Dom Spina, who died almost exactly a year ago today, and I want to pay tribute to Dom because without him, most of the work that I'm going to talk about now would not have happened. So we set about trying to find something that something had never been done before, was to find a drug that was a bronchodilator and an anti-inflammatory in a single molecule. And to do this, we found a drug that actually inhibited phosphodesterase 3 in airway smooth muscle, and it inhibited phosphodesterase 4 in inflammatory cells. And at the same dose, when we give this, we can have both acute bronchodilation, as you'd seen with a beta agonist, and a clear anti-inflammatory effect with the 4 inhibitor. And I want to take you back to this very familiar picture I showed you earlier, because when we sat down, I said to David, well, what do we start? How do we start going about finding a drug from a man who's done it multiple times? And there are very few people on the planet who've done that. And he said, it's obvious. You take a piece of guinea pig trachea, you electrically stimulate it. And I just show you here the same piece of guinea pig trachea in an organ bath that is electrically stimulated every single second over a period of six hours. And you can see it's a beautifully robust preparation. You're stimulating the parasympathetic nerves, releasing acetylcholine, contracting the tissue. And if we add the vehicle for the drug on this, you can see nothing happens. And we made 180 molecules um, with Alec Oxford and David. And one of them, just shown here as 554, forget anything else about it, you can see and almost immediately suppresses the bronchial constriction, just as you'd seen with salmeterol. And over the next three to six hours, you can see this suppression continued. I said to David, what, what should we do next? He said, put it into a dry powder, blow it into the lungs of guinea pigs, challenge them with something that constricts their airways, and if it bronchodilates, you'll pick it up. And I want to just show you one of the first experiments we did, where in the upper panel, we're measuring increasing doses of histamine given to an anaesthetized guinea pig to measure airways resistance, and you can see a beautiful increase in resistance. If we give them lactose powder, which is the carrier for the drug, there is no suppression whatsoever over, in this case, three and a half hours. Whereas in the lower panel, we've added the 554 drug, and you can see by powder, inhaled by a guinea pig, we got complete suppression. And that lasted as it did in vitro over many hours. So we knew we had a drug and we were looking for something that we could give that had a very long duration of action. You can see very good suppression. And what was interesting is that we achieved that without changing blood pressure to any dramatic effect. So we knew we could get a local effect in the airway. But then the second bit is, was this drug that causes bronchodilation capable of anti-inflammatory activity? And again, just some summary of, of work that we did over a number of years. We can show that it suppresses eosinophils, the main inflammatory cell present in allergic disease. The allergen causes the eosinophils to come in the lung. That is suppressed at the same dose of the drug that we get at inhibition of the bronchoconstriction. And you can see other markers of inflammation that are reduced. And if we compare that to now two existing anti-inflammatory drugs that are in the clinic, fluticasone propionate, which is a very, very effective steroid. Reflumolast, I've already mentioned to you, has very recently been approved for COPD. You can see that compared to this, this drug, when inhaled at doses of bronchodilate, also caused a equivalent anti-inflammatory effect to the steroid or the PD-4 inhibitor. So then I set about my long journey around the planet, finding some money. And because to go from there through toxicology to put this into people when you're not Glaxo, you're not Astra, 
um, <coughs> takes a lot of effort. And I have to say it's been a real journey that I've enjoyed doing, but it's taken a lot of time and effort. But the bottom line is we got through toxicology. We used dogs, we used um, rats for 28 days, all of the things that, that any drug has to go through. And, and I think it's why I was happy to talk to the Sun um, journalists not so long ago about the use of dogs, because we just finished the study with dogs that allowed us to pick the dose that we then put into human beings for the first time. And I show you this because the very first patient that inhaled this drug just absolutely told us they felt better. And you can see here that the extent of bronchodilation is profound. It's a very marked change in FEV1 compared to placebo. We did that in a group of, 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 of patients with asthma, and we were very good. The MHRA allowed us to go immediately into asthmatics um, because they said no healthy person is going to help tell us whether or not this drug is effective. So when we then went on, we published some of this work in the end of 2013, a single inhalation in patients with COPD. We got actually very um, good bronchodilation that lasted over many hours, and, and more recently, the company that's taking this forward has got a new formulation that this is now, I think, very clearly a twice-a-day drug, which is exactly what we wanted to try and do. But at the same dose that caused the bronchodilation in people, working with Professor Dave Singh's group in the University of Manchester, we actually did something fairly heroic that other people have done of taking lipopolysaccharide, getting animals to inhale it. We knew that it was blocking neutrophil infiltration in the animal, we then did exactly the same experiment in people. So in this study in Manchester, they inhaled lipopolysaccharide. You then asked the patient to cough up sputum, and you can see at different time points afterwards, the sputum is full of neutrophils. And if we give this drug at the same dose as bronchodilation, you can see that the very clear, statistically significant inhibition of the infiltration of cells into the airway of people. Now, the interesting thing of why people use this model is it's not sensitive to prednisone and steroids. And so, if we're thinking about a disease like COPD, where steroids, for many people, are not effective, clearly a model that is insensitive to steroids but works, we know, to drugs that block phosphodiesterase, we thought was a useful way of checking whether this was truly anti-inflammatory in people. Now, one of the exciting things, and we'd first of all done this in guinea pig trachea, we then were very fortunate to get access to human bronchial smooth muscle. I want you just to look on the left here is what happens if we take a submaximal dose of this drug. We cause it to relax airway smooth muscle. We take a muscarinic receptor antagonist like a pyrrolate. Again, submaximal. The third column is what you'd expect to get if you put the two drugs together. And actually what happens, you get profound, really pronounced synergy in terms of greater bronchodilation. Now, this is important because it means we can lower the doses of existing drugs whilst not compromising on efficacy. And we now know from recent work, again done by um, Professor Singh's group in Manchester, that if we take a low dose of this drug and we take a low dose of a muscarinic receptor antagonist that's widely used in the treatment of COPD, namely teotropium, you can see here that if you add the drug, you get a much faster onset of bronchodilation. So instead of having to wait 40 minutes before you see a change in lung function, you're seeing it in four to five. So this is a really clear indication that there's increased benefit of adding this drug to an anticholinergic. But it's not just on smooth muscle. People with this disease also have hyperinflation and gas trapping. And you can see here again, combining this drug with 554 in people also reduces gas trapping. So everything that we've done in the guinea pig, and I, I say here and now, we never did an experiment in the mouse. It was all done in the guinea pig because it was David that was mentoring me to do this, has ended up with, with a drug, as you can see here, that has clinical benefit. And I'm pleased to say this is now currently in phase 2B in the United States and has been in more than 600 people now. Um, there's no nausea. We've got no major cardiovascular effects, but it's clearly a novel class of bronchodilator that also has anti-inflammatory properties. And my good friend Visa Vajika, who works at Imperial in London, and I knew nothing about this when it came out, uh, we talk about the media, but the Lancet Respiratory Medicine wanted to 
make a lot of noise about this study because it was so new. And I think what Visha has said in this editorial is that this actually could turn out to be one of the most substantial advances in the management of patients with chronic airway obstruction. Because there's very little coming along that's novel, but again, none of this would have happened without guinea pigs. None of it would have happened without the dog. So the question is, do we need further anti-inflammatory drugs? We've now got a very good understanding of how cells recruit into tissues, and we clearly know that we've got lots of drugs that have been through this kind of cascade and not done very well. And one of the things that has been done for many years is to try and measure inflammatory cells into the airway, as I've shown you, both in animals and people. We can wash the lungs out, we can collect sputum, we can quantify inflammatory cells. But we've all been taught from school about chemoattraction and a single mediator causing a particular cell to migrate into a tissue. And I think our concepts of how inflammatory cells come into tissue are very simple. And with my colleagues at King's, particularly Simon Pitchford, he's now back at King's as a lecturer, but when he was a PhD student with me, actually made some interesting observations that many of the leukocytes that migrate out into the tissue, such as the lung, often have inflammatory cells attached to them. And the platelet, um, which is a cell that we are, uh, consider as something that plugs up holes, and Jeremy Pearson knows very well, he spent his career looking at platelets, this is something that's nothing to do with hemostasis. These are platelet leukocyte interactions rolling on the endothelium prior to these cells coming out into um, the tissue, such as the lung. Now, why is this important? Well, we did a very simple experiment one day. We took neutrophils up there, PMNs. We incubated them with endothelium. And you can see if nothing happens, a few of them stick to the, the surface of the blood vessel. If you put platelets back in, as you find them in the circulation, you get lots of um, leukocytes attaching. But more importantly, if we then took animals, and we've done this now in rabbits, we've done it in guinea pigs, we've done it in mice, if you actually remove all their circulating platelets by destroying them, so these are animals without most of their circulating platelets, and we then look at the ability of lipopolysaccharide on the left, which I've already shown you, causes neutrophils to come into the lung, in the animals without platelets, they don't show up. So our concept of a chemical causing one cell, to mig uh, cell type to migrate in vivo is far more complex, and it's very clear both in the lungs and other anatomical areas that the platelets are necessary to optimally recruit leukocytes into the tissue. This is not something I can do in people. Furthermore, others have come up with some really um, interesting examples of microscopy where you can label these different cell types. So the endothelium here is labeled green, you can see the neutrophils are in blue, the platelets are um, in, in red, and that these are actually cooperating. And we can look at that um, over time and see how these cells are actually migrating to tissues. And if the video works, which it did earlier, I just wanted to show you an example which is not my work, but is, is a paper that I'd love to have been the author of, because this shows you using intravital microscopy by looking at the chromaster muscle, and you can see here in green these leukocytes, and the platelets are actually sitting at either end of them, they're polarised, and you can see them there, prior to them sticking to the blood vessel and getting into the tissue. And that's partly why when we take these platelets away, the leukocytes don't show up, they need platelets to cooperate in terms of moving them into the lung. Now, another very, very interesting, and, and Jeremy knows from my time um, in, early on in my career, that I've been interested in platelets um, in the context of, of, of lung disease, and this is a beautiful study, and my PhD student, Simon Cleary, who generated this data at UCSF in San Francisco, with Mark Looney's group. This is based on a, a previous work from Looney's um, study recently that shows that actually megakaryocytes are going into the lung, they're breaking up, and you're getting platelet formulation. And you can actually watch this happen. We've got adhesive platelets in blue, non-adhesive platelets in green, and then we can actually study those that are activated or not in real time in the lungs of an animal. Again, if we've got any volunteers who want to have some kind of thoracic window put in to allow us to do microscopy on their lung, 
I'm happy to talk to you. But this is a good example of why we have to continue to do in vivo work to understand more about how leukocytes behave in the lung, and platelets are necessary for that. The other area, and again another one of my PhD students, Blaise O'Shaughnessy, has very recently done similar experiments with something that we've often neglected in this area, is that there are key pathogens in respiratory diseases, they lead to exacerbations, they can lead to pneumonia, and again we have very little understanding. We've all heard about leukocytes, phagocytosing bacteria, but less is understood about how those leukocytes appear. And from our work showing that platelets are necessary for leukocytes to come into tissue and inflammatory diseases, the obvious thing was were platelets necessary for um, host defense. And just really wanted to show you a few slides here to say that we think they are. So on the left here is a strain of Pseudomonas put into the lung, attached to beads, into the lungs of animals. You can see a profound inflammatory response associated with neutrophils coming into the lung compared to sham animals or the negatively um, um, untreated controls. What we then also saw is that we could find platelets coming in at the same time as leukocytes um, in response to this infection. And very important, when we took the platelets away, not only did the bacterial load go up, but the bacterial load, this is a mild form of infection that is restricted to the lung, suddenly you've got lots of bugs going into the blood and you get death from septicemia. Now, we've spent many, many, many years trying to stop leukocytes coming into the lung to treat acute lung injury. What this tells you is if you get rid of the leukocytes by removing the platelets, we have a self-contained infection in the lung that actually goes systemic and increases your risk of death. And I think that this is a, it's a paper we've just had accepted in an American journal, I think is a really profound observation that says that platelets are absolutely necessary for host defense in the lung. And that is not something that has been generally accepted up until now. So, finally, we need new drugs. Where are we going to find them from? Now, we've already I had the pleasure of giving Rachel uh, a prize earlier on for her work with primates with Fergus Walsh. But one of the interesting projects that she knows I've been involved with over the years started life here working with some marine biologists up in Oban in Scotland. This is their lab view. And they are marine biologists who are interested in why these guys and things smaller than this and oil rigs, things stick to them. We call it biofouling. And they ask a very simple question. What is it that allows things to stick to these artificial structures we put in marine um, environments, whereas the things that live there, nothing sticks to them? And this has been a very interesting story. It's me slightly younger um, with Rebecca Lever. Some of you uh, will know Rebecca. She's at UCL in London. And we took the NERC um, vessel out into the minch and started dredging for these guys. And these guys are echinoderms. We've got all sorts of different echinoderms. And one of the things about these echinoderms is nothing sticks to their surface. And the question is why? Because they are reasonably sedentary compared to fish or other things that are in a marine environment. And to cut a very, very, very long story short, we published actually last year the identification of polysaccharides from the surface of these marine organisms that are anti-inflammatory in vivo in experimental animals. And the thing is, they look a bit like heparin, but they're not anticoagulant because they're far enough back in evolution where we don't have a pressurized cardiovascular system, so we don't probably need anticoagulants. And so these molecules are very interesting because they're completely novel structures that are found on the surface, and it looks very similar to heparan sulfate that we find on the surface of our own vascular endothelium, which I like to think is a bit like Teflon. And anything we do to disturb that Teflon surface, a bit like me trying to poach an egg on a on a, a saucepan that's damaged surface, you get it sticking. Um, the same is true here. If you think about metastasis of tumours, thrombosis, inflammatory responses, it's all happening at the level of the endothelium. So if we can find things in nature that are actually able to restore the negativity of the endothelium, we may have a whole new class of drug. And to that end, working with my good friend Charlie Babington in Scotland, John Hogwood um, and Barbara Malloy, 
who are the National Institute of Biological Standards and Control, which is now part of the MHRA, and others um, working in Edinburgh, David, you're pleased to know, we've identified a whole series of, of new chemicals from these sugar-like structures on the body wall, in this case of a, of a cucumber, um, that actually have very selective binding for some of the adhesion molecules that are involved in leukocytes recruited into tissue. So there's a whole family of new anti-inflammatory drugs I'm convinced out there, um, because we already know that heparin has a very good anti-inflammatory effect, it's just it suffers from being an anticoagulant. And this is just an example from our recent journal, our biological chemistry paper, of the ability of some of these materials that we've identified for being anti-inflammatory. So you might sit here and think, well, we haven't really made any progress. I just wanted to take you back to 1684, if you had asthma. Um, a physician from Oxford defined asthma as a difficult, frequent breathing with a great shaking of the breast without any fever. The organs of breathing, which are the pillars of life, are shaken by this disease as if by an earthquake. Now, the treatment then, before David and others came along, was sleeping on a chair, powder on millipedes and volatile salts. And I think we have made some progress, even as I said to you, <laughs> not always. I recently had the great um, privilege of going to Honiara in the Solomon Islands. And I took this because this is actually in the last three or four years. Their approach to respiratory diseases is putting a big sign up in the market. And it says, stop spitting about places, always cover your mouth and nose when sneezing, and keep children safe at home, which is another approach. And then if we go back not very far, we had this Potter's asthma, smoking mixture, which this is an early form of what David Jack, I think, has improved on greatly, is inhalation of drugs that actually lead to improvement of symptoms. So there's no question that we've made a lot of progress, but as I've said, I think there's still more to do. But I wanted to leave you, ladies and gentlemen, with a book that one of my postdocs found some years ago in Bath, and some of you have heard me speak before, um, have probably seen this, but it's such a beautiful, uh, I think, example of how we've moved forward. This was A.J.D. Cameron, for those of you who don't know him, was a, was a general practitioner in Tunbridge Wells. And this was a book about the treatment of asthma, and this is an absolute quote from the book. I was amazed to find cutaneous reactions could change or disappear entirely by detoxification. From that, I was bound to conclude that whatever part allergy played, it was certainly not a fundamental one. Now, that's very interesting because we're beginning to realise that allergy and asthma often coexist, but one doesn't necessarily lead to the other. A secondary condition of affairs in the syndrome, a condition which departed with adequate detoxification. So what is active detoxification if you're a patient in Tunbridge Wells in 1933? It included colon irrigation. And the method of irrigation, which I'll go with you because you're experimentalists, most of you, and you'll appreciate this, is a stand with a two-gallon container which can be raised or lowered as used. The container is connected by a rubber tube to one of the arms of a Y-shaped glass, to the stem of which an ordinary soft esophageal tube in which an extra aperture is cut is passed into the rectum. So far, so good. <laughs> the water at body temperature is run into the bowel, stopped before discomfort is caused, and then allowed to drain off. This procedure is repeated again and again until the prescribed quantity, anything from two to eight gallons, I've never worked out whether it's imperial or US, has been passed through. The pressure employed is determined by the height of the container above the couch. And I find as a rule a height of 12 inches is most satisfactory. Listen to this bit carefully. It is dangerous to use too much pressure. The optimum for each patient is learnt by experience. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, we may sometimes think, are we doing the right thing with our experiments? Um, I think that I would not want to be a volunteer in this particular experiment. But it's an absolute, this is a, a, a real quote from what was done in Tunbridge Wells in 1933. Now, I presented this at the Edinburgh Science Festival some years ago, and a lady came running up to me at the end, and she said, I hope you're not really laughing at colon irrigation. I get it every week, and my asthma improves. Um, I believe, actually, IBD is basically asthma of a different tube and a different smooth muscle. Maybe there's something in here, but again, I think you'd find most people would consider the treatment we've got now. However, um, it could be improved. It's much improved over this. 
or inhaling millipedes. This is the final bit. I'll leave you that before you go to your canapes. So finally, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. I'd like to thank my current group, many of which have contributed to the work. I certainly want to thank my colleague Michael Walker and Louis Franciosi in, in Vancouver, who did a lot of the work, early work on RPL 554. David, without whom I think we would not have most of the drugs we've currently got. And I think, as I said previously, previous chairman of RDS, um, this man has had a profound influence on this area, and he certainly had a profound influence on me. Charlie Bavington in, in Scotland, Rebecca Lever at UCL, who is a former PhD student of mine. And also I'd like to acknowledge Mario Cazzola and Luigi Calzetta, who have done a lot of the human airway work and human studies in, in Tor Vergata University in Rome. And very much I'd like to stand and acknowledge Dom at the back there with the glasses, because Dom has been an absolutely profound influence on my career in helping. And as I say, tomorrow is the anniversary of him dying prematurely, and he's sorely missed by all of us who knew him. And I'll leave you with this, because I think without the dog, without the guinea pig, we would not have any of the drugs that certainly I've talked about this evening. And I think we will continue to need animal experimentation to help us understand some of the complex things, such as plate leukocyte interactions I've shown you this evening, and to help us find new classes of drug going forward, because we still need them. And I think anybody who tells you otherwise, as I once famously said on a platform like this to Caroline Flint when she told me I should start working in cell culture, I said, you find me the cell that coughs and I'll use it. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.